preparing live stream. Good morning, Cycle 25, and today we are joined by John Portune, one of our very own W6NBC, to talk about skin effect. John, thank you. Take it away. All righty. Pardon me finishing this cheese stick here. All right, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, I got that. All right, skin effect in ham radio. And this is not the way it is. <laughs> I just thought that was cute. <laughs> I like, um, I like uh, this kind of art. <laughs> I'm sure that from time to time, many of you have looked up at a big high tension tower like this. Let me get my mic so I can close talk it. Um, at a big uh, high tension tower like this. And at one time, maybe wondered, why are the wires multiple? Why don't they just use one wire up there? And uh, maybe some enterprising um, engineer that you know said, oh, that's because of skin effect. And you say, what the heck is skin effect? Well, that's what we're going to talk about here today. And the reason they do it, of course, is that, and this is an important principle in skin effect, it applies to ham radio very directly. Small wires have less skin effect. And that's why, of course, they use several primarily. It saves, uh, it has better conductivity than one wire of the same cross-section. But you might say, who cares? <laughs> I've not had to pay attention to skin effect in ham radio. Well, maybe you haven't had to pay attention to it, but uh, it certainly has been present and has some effects. Okay, my objectives today is to answer the question, does skin effect matter to hams? And Interestingly, and this is what got me into it, because I recognized after 54 years now as a ham, that I didn't know why skin effect took place, even though for most of that time, I knew that it did. Why does it happen? And then to give you some real living practical examples in ham radio of where skin effect is significant. Okay, and here's where it is important. It has a lot to do with coax shield current, which of course, all hams are usually pretty familiar with, if they even if they haven't been bitten in the lip by uh, uh, by their microphone, uh, because they have a poor ballon up there on the antenna. But particularly, it has to do with an interest of mine in particular: thin conductors, aluminum and copper foil tape antennas. But skin effect has a good bit to do with loading coil efficiency. Maybe some of you have loading coils if you run HF Mobile. And uh, it plays a big role in that. Also, skin effect is an important issue when you're talking about grounding your station, or as the Brits call it, earthing your station. Um, it's an important factor there. And as I've already mentioned, foil tape antennas, it plays a big role. Okay. This may seem like uh, elementary stuff, but it's less elementary than you realize it because as I say, after 54 years, I realized I didn't understand this. Uh, why it, why skin effect takes place even. All right, what is it? Well, we all basically know what skin effect uh, is. It's the fact that alternating current and especially RF current flows only on the surface of conductors, not all the way through it uniformly. As we see here, a piece of wire cut it, cut in half so we can see the end, and the red symbolizes where the current is. And then you notice, of course, in the middle, there's virtually no current. This is skin effect, basically. This is what hams pretty much generally know. 
it reduces the efficiency of the conductors. And that's its main consequence, uh, which we generally don't want in ham radio, particularly in antennas. So let's take a little physics sidetrack here. Uh, being a train buff as well, I like to use railroad metaphors. So here's one, a sidetrack here. This is the physics sidetrack. We're going to look at some basic physics here, not with a lot of differential equations. I, I don't use equations. I like equations, but like Einstein, I like mind experiments much better, where you see the principle, not write it down in numbers. Okay, we all know, if we studied electricity at all, that current in a wire on the left there, the eye, the current in the wire, flowing along in the current, produces a magnetic field. And it circulates around cylindrically around the wire, just as we see there. And we all probably know the famous right-handed rule. Point your thumb in the direction of the current, and your fingers show you where the magnetic field is. And it's also symbolized in physics with the, I think that's the Greek letter phi, uh, that is, is the symbol of magnetic flux, which is probably better uh, called. Well, this was known for a long time the magnetic flux of the, around the wire. Way back in the 18th, 19th century, it was, it was discovered that if you put current through a wire and put a little piece of cardboard around the wire and sprinkle some iron filings out there, you're going to actually, the, the filings are going to line up according to the magnetic flux or the field around the wire. Pretty basic stuff, but it, was, it wasn't known uh, in Galileo's day. <laughs> Okay, this is a metaphor now. I'm going to show you how you get to how you get to why skin effect takes place. Imagine that that piece of wire cut in half there looking at the end is a bunch of concentric cylinders around each other. It's just as I say, just a mental picture here, it's a mind experiment. But consider it that the wire is just a, a series of concentric cylinders or layers. Also imagine that each of those layers is made up of individual wires. Uh, as we see a few of them here, made up of many individual wires, because this is what leads us to understanding why skin effect. So you'll realize that if you take the, an individual wire out at the edge and the one at the middle, both of them are carrying current, so both of them are generating magnetic flux around the wire. But all of these individual fluxes in a wire, the, the theoretical wires that make up a, a bigger wire, all link together. It's called flux linkage. And uh, that's another Greek letter, which I forget what that is, a tau or something like that. Um, and you can see here's the, flux, here's the flux around the two wires. And these fluxes are linking together due to flux, the, the phenomenon of flux linkage. But notice that most of the linkage around these theoretical small wires that make up all big wires is most linked at the middle. In other words, all of the little individual wires are creating the most additional uh, current in the inner wire. Whereas the wire there at the outside, some of the flux is not, is not linking. It's escaping to the outside world. So there's less flux linkage in the wire the theoretical little wires at the outside. So think of more flux linkage at the outside, less flux linkage on the inside. And so there's the least linkage at the outside. This flux is not linked here on the outside layers. So the total magnetic flux in a wire is stronger in the middle or on the, uh, on the, uh, on the inside than it is at the outside. This is the basic physics of it. Stronger magnetic flux in the middle. But wire inductance, we all familiar with inductance, coils, so forth. Inductance in a wire, and all wires have inductance, it's a property of wires. That's what makes up coils. Uh, it's a property of wire. Inductance in a wire is proportional to the magnetic flux uh, around it. So, therefore, there's higher inductance on the inside of all wires than there is at the outside. 
But as we know, inductance causes AC resistance or reactance as it's properly called in physics. Greater, greater AC uh, reactance inside the wire. So if you have greater AC resistance in the middle of the wire than you have at the outside, you have greater current on the outside than you have on the inside. Very simple, basic physics. So there's less current on the inside than there is on the outside due to the greater flux linkage uh, of the inner wires compared to the outer ones that theoretically make up all big wires. This is the basics of skin effect. I finally now mind experiment or grok, as Heinlein called it in the stranger in a strange new land. I grok, why skin effect? Greater current on the inside due to greater flux, greater flux linkage. So in one sentence, because of flux linkage, there's a stronger magnetic field in the middle of the wire, therefore less current due to greater inductance. All right, now let's look at the consequences in ham radio of skin effect. Coax shield current. This is the one that gets the biggest response when I've now given this uh, lecture a couple of times now uh, at some other radio clubs. I think I may have shown you this before, but uh, we'll look at it again. Here's a dipole, a vertical dipole there on the right, showing the current flowing in the dipole, the current's coming back from the top and the current's going out in the bottom part of it. And you see a piece of coax hooked to it, cut in half so you can see the cross section. As we've pointed out, because of skin effect, there are two conductors in the shield, not just one. We might think of it as one conductor because it's all connected together at DC, but it's not all connected together at AC. The outside of the shield on your coax is a separate conductor from the inside surface of the shield in your coax. And they're separated because of skin effect. And current can flow on both of them independently uh, in both, in both on, or either direction. Now, the center conductor doesn't do this because the center conductor just has one outside surface. But the shield on your coax has two outside surfaces, which are connected together also by skin effect at the end of the coax. I think we've mentioned this before when we talked about balance. And this is why a ballon is necessary to get rid of that skin effect connection at the end of all coax. It's what I call the two wire to three wire transition in all coax. So, rem so think of coax as a three wire transmission line, not a two wire transmission line. But we want it to be a two wire transmission line so we don't have current on the outside. We want the current in coax to flow only on the inside of the shield and on the outside of the center conductor, not on the outside of the shield. That's what the ballon does. So if anybody asks you what's the purpose of a ballon, don't give them the old, the old meaningless saw. Oh, it's to create balanced from unbalanced. No, well, yes, that's true, but it doesn't tell you anything. The reason for a ballon is to get rid of the shield current on your coax. What does, bad, what does shield current on the coax do for you? Well, nothing you want. It disrupts the SWR, it disrupts the tuning of the antenna, and it changes the radiation pattern. So we want to get rid of that outside shield current. I know this is pretty basic stuff, but it's important stuff. And it's not understood by a lot of hams. And it's particularly not understood by a lot of hams that this is caused by skin effect. All right, let's go to another consequence and get out of the physics sidetrack there. All right, the value of thin conductors. This is another surprise to some, uh, some that I've shown this to. Here, as I've shown before, is the skin depth, one skin depth uh, for aluminum and copper in mils or thousandths of an inch. Notice that even at 80 meters, where the skin is, is the thickest, uh, that, that, that the skin depth is only 1.4 thousandth of an inch in copper or 1.7 thousandths of an inch in aluminum. 
or aluminium as the Brits call it. Look down there at, at 70 centimeters, 440 at the bottom. The skin depth at, at, 40, at, at 440 megahertz is only a tenth of a thousandth of an inch or a ten thousandth of an inch. That's very thin. That's much thinner than the shield on the coax. That's why there are two conductors in the coax, because of skin effect. And even in aluminum, it's, um, or, or, you know, two ten thousand point two or, or, uh, or five hundredth of an inch. So that means that in a thin or a small conductor, there's less skin effect. You can see it here symbolized here at the bottom. This is the edge of a thin conductor or looking at a thin conductor, a piece of wire. You can see that in a thin piece of wire, most of the conductor is carrying current. But in a thicker wire, a bigger diameter wire, less of the conductor is carrying current. That's a consequence and an important one. This means that when you build antennas, build them out of stranded wire. Don't use solid wire. I know a lot of people like solid wire for, for antennas, but use stranded wire. You'll have, you'll have less skin effect, less loss. The wire will be more efficient, even simple one. Where is this important? Well, it's important in loading coils. If you're going to wind a loading coil, wind it out of stranded wire, not out of solid wire. And it's important if you're going to build small antennas out of wire, build them out of stranded wire, not solid wire. Here's the example that we're, some of you are familiar with, I've talked about. This is my double inverted delta HF skeleton slot vertical antenna in my backyard. Doesn't, it's not there anymore. I took it down, um, but um, not because I don't like it, just for neighbor appeal. Uh, and uh, it's made with with stranded wire for this very reason. Many of you might have heard of Litz wire. This is not so commonly used anymore, but it's, a, it's, still, a, it's still available. What is Litz wire? Well, Litz wire is wire arranged so that, the, so that the flux linkage in all of the conductors is equal. Therefore, the current in all of the conductors is equal. And it's, Litz wire is made by making bundles of seven in the, in the, in the geometric, efficient geometric shape, and then bundling the bundles, the strands, into additional bundles, additional seven strand bundles. So a 49 strand bundle is typically Litz wire here. And it has much better current handling capacity than, uh, than solid wire. In Litz wire, there's equal flux linkage in all of the wires, therefore, all of the wires are conducting the same amount of current inside or outside. So where is this used? Well, serious hi-fi enthusiasts like to use it because it keeps the highs up in loudspeakers. If you use solid wire or even ordinary seven-strand wire to go out to, the, uh, to your loudspeakers, the highs will get rolled off some. Not a lot, but some. So the purest and hi-fi hi -fi enthusiasts usually are, are gagging purists. Uh, they like to use uh, multi-stranded Litz-type wire, which, which is what you'll often buy if you buy a loudspeaker wire. Now, if you're going to put up an antenna, a wire antenna, here's what I recommend you use. And this is what I use if I'm going to build a wire antenna. Go buy some polystealth wire from Davis RF Engineering or that's not Davis Engineering, it's Davis RF, different company. Uh, it's 19 strands of copper-clad steel aerial wire or antenna wire. They call it aerial wire. It must be a British firm. Anyway, uh, the steel inside doesn't bother the conductivity of the wire at all because of skin effect again. And, uh, and of course, the steel gives the wire great strength. So this wire does not stretch when you put it up. I had a big loop around my house for over two years, didn't stretch an inch, and uh, great stuff. It's a bit expensive, but it comes in sizes from 28 gauge, which I used for my big wire loop around my house. As I said, didn't stretch a bit, and uh, down to 13 gauge, 13 gauge poly stealth wire. Good antenna wire. This is what you want to build wire antennas out of. So. Uh, the 119, 119 meaning just one 
bundle of 19 wire is a little greater than the uh, a little stronger than the uh, uh, than the seven by seven configuration, but a little less flexible. But the poly stealth wire is is the 119 stuff. Okay, another consequence: loading coils. Here's a loading coil, symbolically at least. This might be the loading coil in your hustler mobile whip there out in out on your car, or in my case, pickup truck. With the with the wires in the loading coil wound right next to each other, which is what most of those loading coils are. Notice that the skin effect has an has another nasty effect. When you put those wires turns close together like that, you not only get it to go to the outside, make it go to the outside due to flux linkage, you now now also create flux linkage to the adjacent wires, and this moves the current more away from the, the center. Now, in a close wound solid wire loading coil, all of the current is just on the tips of the wires. There's very little down the middle. So you can see the efficiency of the wire in a loading coil where the wire is solid and wound close together is much lower than if you wound it out of uh, multi-strand wire. Close together is bad. Now, I've looked at the numbers and one-to-one -one spacing between the wires is probably a reasonably good compromise for most practical, most practical loading coils. Three to one is what you want to space them, which is pretty long. Um, if you want to get rid of all the adjacent turn skin effect principally. So here are some bad loading coils or low efficiency loading coils. And yes, it includes all the hustler ones up at the top. That's the high efficiency Hustler 40 meter loading coil there at the bottom and a 20 meter one at the top. That's not an efficient loading coil, believe me. So is that one at the lower left, which is a loading, a home built loading coil. Looks like built with 12 gauge wire, solid wire, close wound. It's not an efficient loading coil. And the trap loading coil there on the right is also not efficient for the same reason. There's much more loss in all of these loading coils than there would be if you spaced the wire and use multi-stranded wire. Here's some good loading coils. Uh, the one on the left is an MFJ thing. One on the bottom is a homebrew coil with a nice, uh, nice design. And the one at the top looks like a commercial coil with a slider for adjustment. And it's, it's one to one space. And that's a pretty reasonable compromise, which I think is what I build most uh, coils with. Here are some even higher efficiency loading coils, a homebrew one on the left there, uh, which looks like about almost two to one spacing, and a really efficient one at the bottom looks like about a five to one spacing sitting in the shop on a, on a sawhorse. All right, finally, <coughs> grounding or earthing of your station, an important thing to do, of course. Here's the right way to ground or earth a tower for example, with flat strap. Now, most of you know this. This is pretty common in the RF world. But now I think you can really see why it matters. Uh, so ground flat strap is the best way to do it. Braided strap works fine. In fact, the braided strap helps even more in the skin effect loss. Uh, so here's a grounded tower done the right way. Also, consequences in foil tape antennas, which is one of my favorites which I've shown, this is copper and aluminum foil tape, which you can get easily off the internet. I've built lots of different kinds of antennas out of it. Here, for example, is, the, is my uh, 40 meter uh, di uh, loaded dipole in the attic of my good buddy WB2FXO, um, made on a cardboard tube, one of these big concrete pouring tubes that you can buy down at, at, uh, home, at home Depot or uh, or lows. And you'll notice here the I've wound them one to one with uh, foil tape. I may have mentioned this, but uh, many people ask, is that foil tape as good for as as round wire for handling power? Yes, it is. And why? Because of skin effect. And the current is only flowing on the surface. And here in the thin 
in thin strap, it, it flows much more efficiently than it does in round wire. A piece of one inch wide, one and a half thousandths of an inch thick copper tape has the same RF conductive power conductive ability as a piece of three eighths inch copper tubing. Now, would you use three eighths inch copper tubing to handle power? Of course, you might use it in a big linear or something like that. Well, you could use half inch, one and a half mil copper tape in the same place, and it would handle the same amount of power. And by the way, aluminum or aluminum is as good as copper for making small antennas. Why? As I showed you earlier, the skin effect is, is twice as thick almost. Even though, so even though the conductivity of aluminum is only 40% of copper, it makes just as good a loading coil or an antenna as does copper. Copper, you don't, you don't use it, don't go with the idea that, oh, I'll build a more efficient antenna by making it out of copper. No, you won't make it out of aluminum. And where does this come to play? Well, as we all know, in the infamous magnetic loop antenna, sometimes called a small, small transmitting loop antenna. Good antenna, a lot of good characteristics to these antennas, uh, and uh, but a lot of them are, mis are misbuilt. And m m many of these you see here are poorly, poorly built antennas, mostly for conductor diameter. And yes, I include the MFJ loop in this in this category. The MFJ loop up there at the top is not a really very efficient magnetic loop because the conductor diameter is too small. You can see the lower left down there has a conductor diameter that's what you need to do to get it efficient. Uh, and that one with the wobbly one there at the bottom right or near the bottom right is, is a very poor example of an inefficient magnetic loop. And the octagonal one you see there in the middle, you don't need to make them octagonal. The best shape for a, a magnetic loop is square. The difference between the square and the round and the octagonal all dates back to the, to the original army loop, which was octagonal. You don't need to do it. The difference between a square loop and an octagonal loop is trivial, but a square loop is much easier to build and much cheaper if you're building it in copper pipe because you don't need all those expensive 45 degree elbows. As I say it, all of the magnetic loops go back to the original army loop created by an army engineer by the name of P Patterson and uh, who, and then Lou McCoy, now deceased, one of the luminaries of ham radio, wrote this article in March 68 for QST and which he built the, he built the army loop uh, out of, uh, the original army loop was 12 foot in diameter. It doesn't need to be that big. But um, in fact, I think four foot is the optimum size of a magnetic loop. Um, the, uh, this army loop uh, was what the original design. And most hams have kind of gotten this image in their mind, and it's stuck. But you don't need to make them octagonal or even round. Why not round? You think that's probably the most efficient shape. Yes, it is. But you ever try to bend large diameter copper pipe or, or any kind of pipe into a circle. Now oh, forget it. It's, it's make it square. It works. It works 95% as well. Why bother? Here's my, uh, in development. Uh, I haven't yet finished it yet, but it's getting close and almost ready for almost ready for prime time, uh, homebrew, what I consider optimum magnetic loop made with PVC pipe, why, why not metal pipe? You don't need it. You just, there's the, everything's flowing on the surface. So cover it with alum, so for the aluminum, stick on aluminum tape, and it works just as well as heavy, heavy copper pipe. Copper pipe's no better here than this loop. And it's a square loop because that's easier to build and, and very nearly as efficient as a round loop. And uh, it works very, very well. And the coupling there you can see is a couple of half inch aluminum bars. I've improved that into a triple aluminum bar works a little better, but uh, there's what I consider to be the, the optimum magnetic loop. Unless you wanna to go to lower frequency, this one will get you down to, to, uh, to 40 meters reasonably, reasonably well. You wanna go below 40 meters, then you're gonna to have to go to a bigger loop. 
uh, frankly. Oh, yes, a littler loop will tune below 40 meters, but the efficiency will be terrible. Here's putting the aluminum foil, by the way, on the PVC pipe. Pretty easy to do. You stick the ends down by folding the ends over, and then you push the pipe onto the aluminum, aluminum foil. Uh, you do this so it doesn't wrinkle and crinkle up when you try to get it on there. And here's the corners of this loop. Uh, uh, this uh, Jim, W6OEK, who's with us here today, uh, pointed me to this method. Just put the aluminum foil on the inside, not on the outside, and it'll couple the ends together very fit. Because you do need a very low conductivity loop here. The ends have to be tightly coupled together. In the Army loop, the Lou McCoy loop, the ends were flattened and bolted together with three bolts, I think, each to get good conductivity. This works very well for the aluminum foil and PVC loop. So in closing, just a quick statement. Skin effect is not an everyday ham topic, but it has more impact on, in, on ham radio than many hams realize. And here, of course, is my little Shih Tzu lolly where there she is over lying on the floor a few feet away now. No, she's not D0GGY. She doesn't have a call sign. I just pretend. And there's my, uh, again, email uh, addresses if you want to get a hold of me. And that's it, folks. Very good, John. Um, does anybody have any, uh, any questions for John on this? Uh, Go ahead, Vince. Want... Unmute. Unmute, Vince. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. John, thank you so much. Uh, illuminating as always. John, I've recently read that PVC pipe, when used near wire or conducting medium, can suffer from heating effect and therefore the bad problem of melting when power is used through it. Are, how are you mitigating that? Are you experiencing that, please? Most of the field is outside of these uh, of these pipes, <laughs> so the effect is very trivial uh, in this case. You're right, though. PVC is not a good RF plastic. You know, it, it's not bad for for HF. It's fine, but if you, I wouldn't use, I don't tend to use uh, PVC at higher frequency. Six meters is fine, probably even two. I built some antennas with PVC. Uh, I don't think this. Uh, I don't think this is a serious problem, but it's a real one. And thanks for bringing it up, there, Vince. Very good, thank you. Yeah, John. Yes. I forget the the math, but uh, skin depth is a function of frequency. Yes. So. Um, Inver an inverse function of frequency. Right. Lower lower frequency, greater depth. Right, and so that affects. Uh, the the thickness of the tape that you're going to use depending on the frequency that you want to use so i i forget the numbers but if anyone's trying to build like a an 80 meter um a foil antenna they should make sure the tape they're getting is actually thick enough yeah or use put two layers on yeah put two layers on don't worry about the glue in between. The RF will go right through the glue without any, without even knowing it's there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think what you're saying is great. You know, I've been making receiving loops with aluminum core PEX, which I forget the, the thickness, but it's a very thin layer of aluminum inside the plastic. Good material. Yeah. And, and I've, I've not tried, I'm going to try transmitting, a build a, building a transmitting loop with the stuff. I think it should work fine, but um, just, just to comment that uh, this stuff really works. And I know there was a, I forget the guy's name. There was a ham down in Arizona was pushing helically, helically wound loops using copper tape. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the spacing and the hel helix and all that stuff. And I think the concept of using thin uh, metal layer for antennas sort of got lost in the discussion about what helically wound means uh, you know so uh the main thing is just give it a try I, I found this stuff really works you bet it does the helically wound uh, uh magnetic loops suffer badly because of the increased conductor resistance that's 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 brought it brought about by making it a helix where if it's a single straight tube it has much less 
And that's where that's where magnetic loops suffer very badly is the ratio between conductor resistance and radiation resistance. Their radiation resistance, which is the radio wave making resistance in all antennas, is very, very, very low in in small magnetic loops. Like sub single ohm, right? It's in the yeah. millohm range. Yeah, I have very, oh, yeah, even micro ohms in some cases, I bet. Wow. But um, if you notice that loop that I showed you, the, my, the magnetic loop that I'm developing, which I'm writing an article, which will be entitled In Search of the Optimum Magnetic Loop. <laughs> you notice the general ratio of the, di the size of the pipe compared to the loop size. You need to maintain that relative, that relative proportion. Otherwise, the efficiency of the loop goes into the dumper. So a three foot diameter or four foot diameter uh, magnetic loop made out of only three quarter inch pipe has very low efficiency. That's why the, that's why the MFJ loop is not a really efficient magnetic loop. So you were using aluminum foil. Did I see that right? Or was that the aluminum tape on yeah, the-, it's, it's the aluminum foil tape? I call it foil. Yeah. It's aluminum. Okay. Self-adhesive aluminum foil tape. Okay, so it's it's thicker than like kitchen aluminum foil because I was just thinking about the kitchen aluminum foil. Not in all cases so easily. Not in all cases. The heavy-duty kitchen aluminum foil is about the same thickness. Okay. It's the common lightweight kitchen aluminum foil. It's thinner. Okay. Um, but you can buy this aluminum foil tape or copper tape often in heavier thicknesses. I, I've seen it, and it's readily available on the internet as much as six mils thick yeah. where typical, typical tape uh, from the internet is only a mil and a half thick usually. Okay. You were talking earlier about the relative skin depth of let's say 80 meters versus 10 meters. Um, it seems to me that if you've the, the 80 meters having a deeper skin depth just means that it would make more use of a thicker conductor but if you size the conductor to work at 10 meters at 100 watts or the same power output, let's say the same power output at 10 meters versus 80 meters, the fact that 80 meters doesn't have the skin depth isn't going to work effect uh, against it. It just means that it could use more of a skin if it wasn't there, but it won't be any less efficient than the 10 meters on the same conductor. Well, it'll be less efficient because if there's less, if there's less, skin depth available, uh, there's going to be greater conductor resistance. It'll sure. But as long as, okay, it, we're, we're discussing different things. As long as your antenna is efficient enough at 10 meters, it should have that same efficiency at 80 meters. It won't be any less efficient. Yes. Yes, it will be. Oh yes, what? definitely. Directly, what? directly inversely proportional efficiency. Yeah, I I, for, I forget the math, but I seem to recall your there's a formula for skin depth, and you're trying to get six or seven uh, of whatever the measurements are at the frequency you're using. Uh, I think uh, three. I think three is the nominal. Yeah, I forget the number, okay. but uh, but Mark, the uh, the concept is if you're building a loop for eighty meters, you want to have thicker foil. Than definitely. You, than you Mark, need it. Definitely. Meters. Definitely. Proportionally okay. thicker. As the as the loop gets bigger, the thickness of the foil and the diameter of the pipes need to go up in proportion. Okay. Otherwise, you, if I, I've got the curves, I can show them to you. I've done them on Easy Neck uh, a dozen times, uh, but the it's amazing how quick the uh, how quick the efficiency of a magnetic loop drops off as the size goes up if you don't take the conductor size up and the thickness of the tape up. Just goes okay. right in the dumper. This loop that I'm building, which I'm going to call the optimum loop, call it optimum because optimization depends a lot on the individual user. You know, if you're if you're 50 miles away from your nearest neighbor, you can build a hundred foot diameter loop, and nobody cares. <laughs> but if you're you're sitting at a small mobile home like me next to the, next to my neighbor, you don't want to build a 12 foot diameter loop. The neighbor will say, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> that way too yeah in fact square uh, loops square loops are better for neighbors than round loops because neighbors think that's just another trellis but they wonder what in the heck is that round thing <laughs> john i have a question sure 
Uh, that was really interesting. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, you did not discuss, at least if I didn't hear it, velocity factor with respect to coax and skin effect. Do you no. want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, I, I'm not but, quite sure what you're meaning, Jim. Well, I don't know that I know what I mean. But, um, <laughs> but if, you, if you're talking about skin effect and then you have a dielectric material and you have this velocity factor, what's the relationship between skin effect and then you add a dielectric? I don't think there's any relationship. Because foam dielectric will have a different velocity factor than a solid polyethylene. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the dielectric constant of the, of the space between the inner conductor and the inside of the outer conductor definitely affects the velocity factor. Okay. And the other thing that uh, with respect to um, coils one on PVC, we did some and we ended up with phenolic. Uh, better, much better material. Yeah. The uh, PVC tended to heat. Oh, yeah very quickly at fairly low power. Um, all right, uh, I'm still thinking about the velocity factor and the skin effect. The relationship between velocity factor and skin effect. I, I, I still don't see where there is any. Okay. Because the only place the skin effect is, is taking place is between the, the, the inside of the, of the shield and the outside of the shield. And if you have a ballon up there, the outside of the shield doesn't exist. Okay. The, the other question I have is um, the uh, ballon balanced, unbalanced. When you have a choke at the feed point, which you should have to stop the common mode currents, is it really a ballon at that point or is it better just to call it a choke? Well, I'm, hold, I'm holding my hand up like I'm touching the antenna. But. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's a good comment, uh, Jim, because uh, uh, that this is why I shy away from this classical answer for what's a ballon based on the name ballon. Mm -hmm. It goes back to tra it goes back to telephone line theory, where all of this in originally. I don't like to even use the term because it leads to questions like that. Uh, so yeah, what? Show they're what all you... chokes. They're okay. all shield chokes. That's what yeah. a that's what a bal ballon is. It's a sh outside shield choke. No matter how you do it, whether you do it as a current ballon or a voltage ballon with ferrites or with with an ugly ballon by winding loops of coax, the, the whole thing that you're doing there is to choke the current off the outside of the shield. Okay. That's what it's for. And if I may, one more question. Sure. In a lot of articles, uh, they don't like uh, a braided ground strap or earth strap. And in the picture you had of the tower, that's exactly what I did. I used about inch and a half wide braid to a grounding system or an earthing system. But in some articles, they say not to use braid that's not as efficient. I've never understood that. It seems like it's the other way around. I don't around. think that's right. Because okay. as I was pointed, I point out, pointed out in this lecture, anytime you break your conductor down into smaller fine wires, you improve the skin effect uh, uh, loss in the in, in the conductor. So to me, braided braid works better than a solid conductor. Very. Thank you. Very interesting. So I have a, I have a question. Yeah, John, uh, you said trellis. My ears just went boom. Uh, my wife has a trellis that is wood. It's seven foot square. Sure. It's at the side of our property. I'm just thinking a, a square copper tube, seven by seven foot down to, I'm, I'm wondering if I can get away with a remote tuner and then bring it into the shack, which would be a very short coaxial run. It's right at my wall here. Well, in my uh, little le in the lecture I do on uh, copper foil tape antennas, which I gave at the QSO Expo uh, here some months yeah. ago now, uh, I show a I show a rose trellis that uses copper foil tape on the back of it to make yep. it to make an antenna. And I, I I don't I don't think the roses or the or the trellis and uh, if it's wood and it was prone to getting wet, I'm not sure that would be so good. But if you use the plastic the plastic rose trellis, which you can buy at any home home center, that makes a great support for a uh, for aluminum 
or copper foil tape uh, to build all sorts of antennas on the back of it. <laughs> okay, John, you really got me thinking now because that is a space that that uh, <clears throat> would be invisible to my wife. Not that that's a big deal, but it would be invisible to my wife. I've got no neighbors at that where that trellis is, and a um, another um, uh, one of the reasons I didn't put the tower up is is. Uh, back up is, is more neighbors than anything else. And also my verticals are working so well. I thought, what's the point? And I'm also, uh, I've also, uh, I've, I've had uh, uh, my eyes open up to uh, Mike Walker, ba 3 mw was circulating an article from a Indian ham about the, the awful uh, radiation pattern of NFIDs. Mm -hmm. And um, really got me thinking that, you know, my NFIDs not doing me any favors. It's a piece of wire up through a tree, you know, it, 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 at, 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 at its best, it's a piece of wire up in a tree. And now I'm thinking, what else could I put out there that would work, uh, you know, oh. with the new <laughs> propagation and all the rest? Because the verticals, especially on the high bands, aren't, aren't necessarily the best thing out there. Yeah, Peter, Peter, if, thinking... if, if your trellis is right next to the house. No, it's not. It's, it's separate, John. It's setting out. It's a private. It's a privacy screen, really, for our barbecue area. Oh, right. that so would be good. Yeah, that yeah. would be, that would be good. Yeah, it's okay, yeah, gotta, a lovely copper it's, uh, frame around. That's that. what that's what I'm thinking. Of. And if I mounted the frame just like off the the back of the trellis, so it's not for water, just exactly just have it have it there. Um, it's wonderfully right, so cosmetic. I think Mary so, would love it, Peter. So, Peter, you could put a rotator under the trellis, and if your neighbors wonder why your trellis is rotating, <laughs> <laughs> just tell them it's to get the most sun. It's best to do that. It's best to do that when your wife is out of town. For there you go. Days. That's an automatic wow. sun-following trellis. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that'll right. You, you that'll baffle the hell out of them. You <laughs> really should now. try this, aluminum this, this extrusion. That might be less obvious than copper. Yeah. Only at the back, Jim. It won't. It won't. It just simply won't. It's uh, we we back onto a bit of wild city land, so our it's not on our, our neighbor's property. Ends ten feet north of the, or south of that. It sits there all by itself uh, at the edge of our property, and it's just a privacy screen. That's all. It's you a thick it on one. The back side. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly right. I could do it on the back side. I'm just wondering. Uh, so if I put a copper, let's pretend I'm putting a copper square out there, seven by seven by seven. What do I terminate that to? Can I get away with a remote auto tuner on that spot or, or not? Yeah. Any thoughts? So if you're building a magnetic loop antenna, which I think is what you're talking about, that would say cover 80 and 40. You're going to need a capacitor to tune it to resonance, and you're going to have to be able to tune that capacitor remotely. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to handle high current. So it uh, wouldn't it be better, John, with a vacuum vari a vacuum variable as opposed to an air variable? If yeah, it, it, dep it de depends on how much power you're running. Well, like, my, my initial experiment, let's pretend my initial experiment's at five watts, which is what I tend to run yeah. a lot of here anyway. No, so that's Peter. Yeah. You, it, it's not going to be a conventional remote tuner. Uh, you definitely need to go uh, research how magnetic loops work. They require, they have a, they're incredibly high Q, which means yeah. they have an incredibly narrow bandwidth, like five kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. Yeah. In some Mark, cases, right? Mark, I've got, I've got an Alex loop that I've used a lot. So I, okay. I, I understand the basics. But so then you definitely, you will definitely need a remote tuner, but it's not going to be like an AD, uh, LDG kind of remote tuner. tuner. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll have to end up building something for it. Well, that still would be cool. Okay, guys, yep. that's great. Thanks very much. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you so much, folks. At this point, I'm going to end the recording. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And John, magnificent at 